Hello, everyone. My name is Jonathan Torres, and I'm here today with my group number four. Today, we're going to be presenting on SARS versus COVID-19 and the effects on communities of color. My group members are Taisha Bolas, Victor Rivera, and Terry Sack. And I'll be passing it over to Victor so he could go ahead and start the presentation. So today I'm gonna to be talking about two things, the epidemiological triad and signs and symptoms. So the epidemiological triad consists of three parts. First is the host, which are the organisms that can be infected, um, which is humans and bats for COVID-19 and humans and civets for SARS, also known as severe acute respiratory syndrome. The agent or microorganism that causes these diseases is SARS-CoV for SARS and SARS-CoV-2 for COVID-19. The environment um, which these diseases spread very easily in are areas that are poorly ventilated with colder temperatures and small confined spaces. So think of like a family of five in a one bedroom apartment with no fan and no heater, this virus is gonna spread very easily there. So the patho um, behind COVID and SARS is that they're both respiratory diseases. They're spread through um, airborne and mucosal droplets, um, through things like coughing, sneezing, or speaking, or commonly touched surfaces. So COVID-19 is primarily spread through things like airborne um, droplets, so like coughing and then someone breathing that uh, virus in. For SARS, it's commonly spread through um, coughing like directly in someone's face. So you're gonna see like caregivers um, be mostly affected or um, coughing on your hand and like touching a doorknob and someone else coming and touching that doorknob and touching like your eyes, nose or mouth, for example. So those most at risk um, are the elderly because of a weaker, weakened immune system. Those with comorbidities like hypertension, uh, diabetes, and especially COPD. Those with chronic illnesses like um, HIV and AIDS or cancer patients because they have the weakened immune system. And minorities in poverty. So research has shown that African Americans, Native Americans, and Hispanics are more likely to be infected, hospitalized, and even die from these viruses. And lastly, again, is the caregivers, the healthcare workers, because they have direct contact with these patients. Um, so the signs and symptoms that are common in both SARS and COVID are your cold and flu-like symptoms. This is going to include things like fever, cough, chills, fatigue, um, things like that. The main difference is that with COVID-19, you're going to have that novelty sign and symptom of no taste and no smell. Um, and in severe cases, patients could get pneumonia, blood clots, organ failure, and even respiratory failure, where they need a mechanical vent to breathe for them. Um, for SARS, the novelty symptoms are going to be that fever over 100.4, and most of these patients are gonna end up with pneumonia and uh, respiratory failure. Um, so that concludes my part, now passing it on to Jonathan. Hello everyone, my name is Jonathan Torres, and today I'm gonna to be um, discussing the SARS and COVID-19 diseases, how they were discovered, early management, as well as how vulnerable populations were affected by these two diseases. So moving on to the history of condition and disease. So according to the CDC, severe acute respiratory syndrome, also known as SARS-CoV, is a viral microorganism that causes respiratory disease. It was first discovered in Asia of February 2003, and it has spread more than 12 dozen countries. As of today, there are currently no known SARS transmission since it was last reported in China of 2004 during an outbreak. According to the CDC, COVID-19, also known as SARS-CoV-2, is a viral microorganism that causes respiratory disease as well. It was first discovered on December 12, 2019, when a group of patients in Wuhan, China, began to experience symptoms of an atypical pneumonia that was not responding to treatment. These patients had all been linked to being associated with Huan Seafood Wholesale Market in Wuhan, China. The similarities of SARS and COVID-19 is that they both originated from a coronavirus microorganism and researchers have shown that the genomic characterization of SARS-CoV-2 share approximately 80% of the genome with SARS-CoV. However, researchers have found some slight differences between the two viruses. For example, SARS-CoV incubation period is the mean days of four to five days, and the incubation period for COVID-19 is 5.1 days. In addition, intestinal symptoms occur in 20 to 25% of cases in SARS, and intestinal symptoms are rare in COVID-19. In a recent study conducted to discuss the first case of COVID-19 in the U.S., 
Researchers found that the first case was discovered on January 19, 2020 in Washington when a 35-year-old male presented to their urgent care experiencing cough and fever. The patient had just returned from visiting his family in Wuhan, China. According to the study, the CDC was informed the patient was tested for COVID-19 using a nasal pharyngeal swab and was considered a person under investigation, otherwise known as a PUI. CDC confirmed that the patient's nasal pharyngeal swab tested positive for SARS-CoV-2 by real-time reverse transcriptase polymerase chain reaction, otherwise known as a PCR. The patient was admitted to the Airborne Isolation Unit at Providence Regional Medical Center for observation with healthcare workers following CDC recommendations for contact droplet and airborne precautions with eye protection. On hospital day six, illness day 10, the patient's chest x-ray revealed basal streaky opacities in both lungs consistent with the development of that atypical pneumonia. Now moving on to discussing the early management. So according to the CDC, the early management for SARS and COVID-19 begins with washing hands frequently, <coughs> covering cough and sneezes, wearing a mask, and social distancing for prevention of acquiring disease. If you begin to experience symptoms of fevers, chills, cough, shortness of breath, like Victor mentioned, that new loss or taste of smell, muscle, body aches, diarrhea, congestion, or runny nose, so social isolation is indicated. Next, it is important to get tested for COVID-19 to see if you're positive for the virus. Since there has been no uh, SARS outbreak since 2004, there is a limited amount of up-to-date literature discussing the early management of the disease. However, shortly after the SARS pandemic of 2002, a study was conducted in 2003 discussing SARS, and researchers found that early management consisted of administering broad-spectrum antibiotics and broad-spectrum antiviral agents such as ribavirin. Early management for COVID-19 consists of symptom management with over-the-counter medications such as Tylenol and ibuprofen. In a recent study um, discussing evidence-based management guidelines for COVID-19 pandemic, researchers found that there is a preventative management, supportive management, management of the critically ill, and operative management for these patients. Preventative measures include decreasing human-to-human -human contact to decrease the, de the disease transmission, healthcare workers utilizing appropriate PPE, such as wearing surgical masks, N95s, goggles, and gowns when in direct contact with the patient with COVID-19, and teaching patients to cover their nose, mouth, or coughing or sneezing, practicing hand hygiene frequently, and utilizing disposable equipment when available disinfecting frequently touched items and by practicing social distancing. Supportive management includes administration of IV fluids, supplemental oxygen therapy, and administering medications, for example, corticosteroids. Management of the critically ill includes admission to the ICU, non-invasive ventilation such as CPAP and BiPAP, endotracheal intubation, invasive mechanical vent ventilation, extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, and fluid resuscitation with vasopressors if indicated. Operative management includes lung transplant as deemed necessary. Now moving on to vulnerable populations affected. Politics has significantly affected multiple vulnerable populations during the COVID-19 pandemic, and in particularly, it has negatively impacted the Asian population. Starting from the beginning stages of the COVID-19 pandemic, Speculation began to arise about the origin of the virus, and a U.S. senator proposed that the virus was a result of a failed Chinese attempt to create a bioweapon. In a recent study discussing anti-Asian xenophobia and hate crimes committed during the COVID-19 pandemic, authors state that the former president, Donald Trump, referred to the COVID-19 virus as the Wuhan virus, the Chinese virus, and the Kung flu. Authors go on to mention that Trump's discrimination is a century-old racist remark that Asian Americans are carriers of crime and illness. These racist remarks led to hate crimes such as stabbings, a woman getting acid thrown on her face, and a woman getting punched in the face along with many other cases. Other vulnerable populations affected include Black, Latinos, and Native Americans, and research supports that these minority groups test positive for and die of COVID-19 at higher proportion than other racial and ethnic groups. Approximately 30% of 
of COVID-19 cases occurred in Black Americans and 34% occurred in Latino Americans. These minority groups have less access to third-party testing centers and are often left relying on government-based resources, which is much slower in results, uh, may take a few days to come in, thus delaying essential care. Research supports that migrants face access barriers due to many factors. However, the common factor is the lack of confidence in the COVID-19 vaccines due to the mistrust of governments and health systems. Older people and people with chronic pre-existing conditions have been reported to be at higher risk of severe COVID-19, thus leading to hospitalization, admission to the intensive care unit, and possibly death. Pre-existing conditions include hypertension, cardiovascular disease, chronic kidney disease, liver disease, cancer, obesity, and immunosuppression, as previously mentioned by Victor as well. Other barriers include language barrier, no health insurance, exposure as frontline healthcare workers, and inaccurate information about the COVID-19 vaccine, as well as mistrust in the health system. So what can we do as nurses? As nurses, we can provide a spiritual approach in disaster situations, holistically assessing the patient, recognizing values and beliefs, and detecting spiritual needs. As healthcare providers caring for patients with COVID-19, we should consider the impact of limited literacy or language barriers when explaining strategies to mitigate COVID-19 exposures. Using strategies for low health literacy, such as using plain language and accessible teach-back approaches, education should be provided on risk factors and prevention strategies, how to access the testing and care for COVID-19, and the potential future role of vaccines in vulnerable populations. Working with peer societies throughout the medical and scientific community to support policy efforts that attempt to address these important social and structural determinants of health. And lastly, advocating for underrepresented minority patients who are becoming critically ill and dying at disproportionate rates by targeting policy interventions that protect high-risk and ethnic minority groups, thus reducing ongoing health inequities in COVID-19 and long-standing disparities. Now passing it on to Taisha. As reported by John Hopkins and the CDC, here is the current status of SARS and COVID-19. Globally, 8,096 people were infected with SARS and 774 died as a result. A total of 156 reported U.S. SARS cases from 2003 epidemic remain under investigation, with 137 cases classified according to previous surveillance criteria as suspect SARS and 19 classified as probable SARS. Only 18 people in the United States had laboratory evidence of SARS-CoV infection. SARS did not cause any deaths in the United States. The global outbreak of SARS was contained in July 2003. And like Jonathan mentioned, since 2004, there have not been any reports of SARS anywhere in the world. Globally, COVID-19 infected 675 million people and resulted in 9.8 million deaths. In the U.S., 103 people were infected and 1.1 million people died. Some still face a high risk of severe, severe illness and death from COVID-19, especially those with underlying health problems. Although many people still face serious illness, we, we are in a much better position than we were three years ago, thanks to the widespread vaccination and other prevention and control measures. Now, now here's the morbidity and mortality week, week report prepared by the CDC. As of February 22nd, 2023, the current seven day average of weekly new cases 33,733 decreased 9.2% compared with the previous seven-day average, 37,135. And also the current uh, seven-day average of new deaths, which is 344, decreased 15.2% compared with the previous seven-day average, which was 405. In the first two years of the pandemic, COVID-19 was identified as the third leading cause of death in the United States, trailing only heart disease and cancer. Provisional mortality data in indicate that despite a lower number of COVID-19 related deaths reported to date, COVID-19 remains the third leading cause of death in the United States. 
and I'm going to pass it to Terry. Hi, my name is Terry, and I will be discussing the current management, starting off with the available treatment for SARS. Um, usually, antiviral medication is given combined with the anti retroviral medication that's shown here <clears throat> on, <clears throat> on the poster. There's also corticosteroid and gamma goblet. Now looking at the available treatment for COVID, um, here's a list of antiviral medication presented. The common one given is Paxlovid. Medications pres prescribed are effective when started immediately within five days from when the symptoms started. Um, as mentioned from Jonathan, <clears throat> if symptoms are mild, then can start over-the-counter medication like Tylenol, Motrin, or Advil. Another treatment is the convalescent plasma. The, pa the plasma contains antibody to fight against the virus. This is effective with those who are immunocompromised or getting immunosuppressive treatment. Next, looking at the control measures to prevent SARS and COVID are pretty much similar social distance by being six feet apart, covering mouth, nose with tissue when coughing and sneezing, then making sure to throw away the tissue immediately. And also keep in mind, don't touch your eyes, nose or mouth, wear the appropriate face mask, um, washing your hand often, <laughs> and then making sure disinfecting any items or surfaces that was touched by the infected person. Also, um, if a person tests positive before it was 14 days, now it's changed to um, to remain at home and isolate for five days. And also make sure to get vaccinated to prevent serious complications when looking at vaccine and booster, common vaccine and boosters that are that most people usually get are either Pfizer or Moderna. And here's a list of other vaccines. Now, looking at um, healthy people 2030 goals and object objective, the ability to access and obtain healthcare services um, with the objective, um, better communication with the health care team and with the community, health information given an easier way to comprehend, uh, also using media platform to promote health information and disease prevention program through social media like Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, or WhatsApp. Next, looking at the economic stability goal by providing employment opportunity and guidance to career counseling and child care service, uh, looking at the objectives, uh, decrease poverty, increase employment rate, reducing hunger will improve the health and well-being of each individual. So that wraps up our group presentation and thank you for your time.